Welcome to Lincoln Fire and Rescue. I'm your host, Dale Johnson. May is Stroke Awareness Month. Half the people who suffer a stroke either drive to the hospital themselves or they have someone drive them there, and the other half call 911. If the half who drove themselves or someone drove them to the hospital had called 911, their chances of surviving the entire ordeal intact would have been much higher. We talk about strokes today on Lincoln Fire and Rescue on LNK TV with Aaron Pospisil. Aaron is EMS supervisor for LFR and Bailey, or Amber Bailey. Amber is stroke program coordinator at CHI Health St. Elizabeth. Hello, Amber. Hello, Aaron. Hi. All right, today you will learn how to detect a stroke. It's as easy as remembering FAST. We'll tell you what that acronym stands for. Viewers might think they would get to a hospital faster than LFR, but that's not, not true, not is no. it, Aaron? No. no, so the big thing that we want to push with uh, our folks that feel that they may be suffering a stroke is kind of like you mentioned, is as soon as you feel the onset of symptoms, you want to call 911. We're, we're going to get there in a short amount of time. We're going to do a quick assessment. Uh, the two advantages that we have is if your condition worsens from the time that we pick you up en route to the hospital, we can manage and treat those changes. Uh, but the biggest thing is uh, with patients that we have decided are suffering a stroke, uh, they're going to be one of the few patients that we transport lights and siren uh, in the Lincoln system. Uh, we don't transport everybody to the hospital with lights and siren. Uh, we reserve that for uh, the people that are uh, on a short time frame. So I know that you guys have talked about heart attacks and stuff like that mm -hmm. in the past. Strokes are similar because with heart attacks, time is muscle, but with strokes, time is brain. So those are the folks that are, we're gonna get to the hospital in a short amount of time, and the only way that we can do that is with lights and siren. 90% so. of the time, the goal is 90% of the time arrive at the scene within eight minutes. Yes. And as I thought about this, I'm thinking, well, eight minutes, uh, what do I have to do in order to get someone who is having a stroke ready into the car, boom, I'm there. And it, it takes a lot more than eight minutes. You've, you've, you've gotta get yourself ready, you have to yeah. find your keys, you have to make sure that the person who's having a stroke, you can walk or can get yep. to a vehicle. Yep. Now you're in the vehicle. Now you're in traffic, for exactly. heaven's sakes. Yep. Now you, where's the hospital? You, because you're not thinking rationally right. at the moment. You're trying right. to help a loved one. Right. There's more than eight minutes worth of prep exactly. going on there. Yep. Plus, eight minutes is arriving at the scene. When you arrive, now you're surrounded by experts. Right. The stroke patient right. is surrounded by experts. And the, the big thing to remember with the eight minutes is that's for our ambulances to get there. Mm -hmm. So we only have uh, seven ambulances in the, si in the system, but we have 14 fire engines, soon to be 15 and hopefully 16 at some point. Um, so the fire engines are gonna be there super quick. Uh, all of our fire engines have paramedics, uh, just like our medic units do, so they can begin the assessment, uh, begin the history gathering, uh, doing the stroke scale assessment, that sort of thing. So theoretically, if things were working the way that we want it to, when the medic unit shows up, it's literally, we bring the stretcher in, we move you to the stretcher, we're out to the ambulance, and off the, off the road we go. We, we do very, very few things on scene, short of the assessment, getting a blood sugar, um, gathering a few, uh, a few things with your medical history. But outside of that, everything else that we're gonna do for you is gonna be in route to the hospital. Mm -hmm. Good point. What is a stroke? Um, I usually refer to a stroke as a brain attack only because people take heart attack very seriously. If someone thinks they're having a heart attack, they don't usually hesitate to call 911. A stroke is similar, only it's for your brain. It's still where you could either have a blockage in your brain where you're depriving a certain area of oxygenation and blood volume. So you have an area of dead tissue now in your brain. Just like with a heart attack, you have an area of dead cardiac muscle, dead heart muscle. So it's just as serious. I try to usually refer to the term brain attack um, with stroke so that people try to take it more seriously and call 911. Mm -hmm. I have read about stroke mimics. Yes, sir. Aaron? Yep. What are those, and can those, and to what extent can those be detected by the professionals? Uh, well, a couple of things. So, like the the most common one that we see that's a stroke mimic is hypoglycemia or low blood sugar. So, one of the few things that we will do on scene is to check the patient's blood sugar, uh, and that's just again just to rule out that okay, this isn't a hypoglycemic episode, they truly are having a stroke. Um, 
A couple other things are overdose. Um, so we'll gain that by looking at medical history, uh, making sure that they've been taking their meds as they're, as, as they're prescribed. Uh, so again, it's just a couple of quick things to rule out uh, some of the possible mimics. And you know, the biggest thing for us is once we kind of gather a little bit of information, we gather a set of vital signs, we get that blood sugar reading, we're gonna do the Cincinnati pre-hospital stroke scale on you. And the nice thing about that is that even if one of those segments of the stroke scale test positive, we declare a stroke alert. And that sets a whole host of things in motion at the receiving facility. So. What does the stroke feel like? There's not always pain associated with it. The pain is usually for the bleed stroke patients, the hemorrhagic, where you have what we call a thunderclap headache. So it'd be just an intense, severe migraine right away. But for the most part, when we think of stroke, we think of the blockage strokes, ischemic strokes, and they present with the fast symptoms. So you, it, it's not necessarily pain as it would be more of a loss of sensation in one side or the other, numbness, tingling, inability to utilize that side of your body. Does it get worse? If, I, if, I, if, if something's going on with me and I don't exactly know what it is, does it, does it go away quickly? Does it have If symptoms go effects? away, if symptoms resolve completely, that's called a transient ischemic attack or a TIA, which I like to also compare to heart attack again. Those are basically like chest pain. That's mm -hmm. a, a TIA is a warning sign for a stroke. 40% of people who have a TIA will go on to have a stroke. So that's your chest pain, as if you're heart, having a heart attack, that's what it is to your brain when you're having a stroke. Um, so those symptoms do resolve. That doesn't put you at less risk though for having a stroke later on. It still requires medical attention and we can still do screening after you've arrived to the hospital to define what your risk of having a stroke would be later on. And for us, the same kind of same thing for us is if, if you are suffering a TIA in which your symptoms either resolve prior to us getting there or they resolve in our presence, we still call the hospital and declare a stroke alert just because the patient still needs to get the, some of the definitive treatment that somebody that was having a stroke needs to have. My mother suffered a stroke at the age of 39. So wow. she had, and she just passed away at 82. So 60 or 50 do the math uh, years and hers That's was behind good. her eye. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. an inoperable point from mm -hmm. what we understand when it occurred back in the 70s. Uh, how are strokes, are strokes operable? Hers wasn't. Can you operate to get rid of a stroke? How do you go about treating a stroke? There are two types of treatment that we use for stroke patients. The gold standard of treatment is called Alteplase. It's a medication that has to be given through an IV in the hospital but there are limitations to it. So it, that is a medication that can only be given up to four and a half hours after your symptoms start. Um, that's the unfortunate part of it. However, beyond that, there is a newer procedure out called a mechanical thrombectomy procedure where you go into a, a cath lab, they go through your femoral artery up to the stroke and pull it out basically in, in layman's terms and that clears up that stroke. Um, there's a few limitations to that, is that there, it ha that stroke has to be in a specific area of the brain, which we would find on imaging at the hospital. And, but that goes up to 24 hours from the time of onset. So you have a bigger window for that. So, and that's just be been within the last few years that that's really come to fruition. So the Alteplase medication has been around for about 20 years. Um, and in the last five years, we've really made a lot of progression with stroke care. Aaron and Amber, I want you to start at the beginning when you arrive at the scene, Aaron, because I've always been fascinated with this chain, mm -hmm. this chain that Lincoln has developed so well between the people in the field and the people at the medical facilities. And I'm privileged to hear a little bit of that on the scanner so I can see the cooperation and the questions and the information that the, the medical professional is providing to the hospital that helps you at the hospital mm -hmm. know what to expect when the ambulance pulls up. Right. So start with on the scene and the communication and the process. Sure. Start. So thankfully in the city of Lincoln, we're, we're lucky enough to have good relationship between us with the fire department and all of our folks at all of the, the receiving facilities, all of the hospitals. So that kind of makes our lives 
a lot easier. Uh, but for us, we show up on scene, we do a quick patient assessment, obtain a set of vital signs, history, uh, blood sugar, like I mentioned before, and then we do the Cincinnati uh, pre-hospital stroke assessment. And if any of those signs indicate that the patient may be having a stroke, uh, again, we kind of do what we can to minimize the amount of time that we're on scene and save most of our interventions for whatever we need to carry out for the transport time. But prior to leaving the scene, uh, the paramedic on the medic unit will make contact to the hospital. Uh, they'll give the uh, basically a short and sweet synopsis of what's going on with the patient. And then <clears throat> we will say, we're declaring this a stroke alert. And those are like the magic words. When the receiving hospital hears us say stroke alert or uh, a cardiac alert, like we've mentioned with heart attacks in the past, it's uh, like I mentioned before, it sets off a whole chain of events within the receiving facility. So we'll say, for example, with our patient, we're taking them to St. Elizabeth, we declare a stroke alert, we transport lights and siren uh, to St. Elizabeth, and when we get into the ER, we go to a designated station that's called a stroke stop. Um, and I'll kind of let Amber kind of go from there because that's her, her realm. All right, the ambulance pulls up. What is so we, we created the stroke stop with the collaboration of Lincoln Fire and Rescue, and it's not anything sophisticated at no, all. It is a sign on the sign wall on the that wall. says stroke stop <laughs> for the purpose that we don't want anybody sitting there for very yeah. long. We want it to just be a brief stop. It's nothing pretty and, and move on to CAT scans. So they're stopping at this stroke stop. Our lab is coming up drawing blood at the same time that report is being given and the ED provider is actually physically assessing that patient. So that is happening within, that is happening immediately yeah. upon arrival. And we don't take our pati the patient off of our stretcher, they stay on mm -hmm. our stretcher. So there's again, one less thing that we mm -hmm. have to worry about doing, uh, again, to shorten that window uh, for the patient. And because of that pre-hospital notification that we aren't getting when people drive themselves to the hospital, mm -hmm they're waiting right there. We have lab waiting, the ED nurse is waiting, the ED physician is waiting at the stroke stop for that patient to, to arrive. And then um, with Lincoln and, Fire, Lincoln Fire and Rescue's cooperation, they are taking with the ED nurse the patient straight to the CAT scan. So we don't have any time wasted to move them to one of our ED, ED cots and then taking that cot out of a room and going to CAT scan. They're taking them directly there and transferring them over to the CAT scan machine. Okay, I, I want to reiterate that to viewers. The fact that if you drive yourself to the hospital or have someone drive you to the hospital, if someone is having a stroke, you lose that time. Mm -hmm. You lose this link that has been created for your benefit. So yeah. call 911 right away. Yeah. If you're How out in an airport, air park, for example, and we give St. Elizabeth a, a heads up, we, we've just given them a 15 to 20 minute window mm -hmm. where they can expect us. So they can clear out the CT if there's patients that are in there getting their stuff done. They can get the hospital, the, the ER nurse and the lab there ready to go. So it's, it's literally, there is no waiting game uh, when, we, when we show up at the ER. I mentioned the acronym. Let's walk through those FAST, how the public can detect if someone's having a stroke. Uh, so FAST is the acronym. F is for face, and that's typically facial drooping, so you'd have somebody smile. If they have one side or the other that's drooping, that would be a positive um, stroke symptom. A is arms, that would be, um, you have your patient hold out their arms and it'd be drifting of one arm or the other one, or the inability to lift that arm at all. S is speech, and that's really any type of abnormal speech. That would be the inability for patients to say anything. That would be them slurring words um, or just stating things that don't make sense. Um, so, and then T is time. The thing that Aaron was saying about the Cincinnati pre-hospital scale, that really is the FAST acronym minus the T. The T is for, um, T is for time, which they're already aware of, the time is for patients to call 911 or family members to call 911. The Cincinnati is um, face arm speech since they're already yep. there with the time. Yep. So we're all using the same message of face arm speech mm -hmm. yep. just in two different ways. Yep. What the public needs to know though is the T for time to call yep. 911 right yep. away. Yep, if you noticed any of the, those symptoms, don't delay, don't try to call your friends, don't try to call family, call 911 and get us there and we'll, we'll get you to the hospital. A stroke is not a death sentence. Is no, no, people no, recover from not. strokes. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
especially because of the progression within specifically the last five years in stroke. Um, there are a lot of research going on with stroke right now, a lot of trials in place to extend the window for the alta place, try and be able to go to di more parts of the brain for that mechanical thrombectomy procedure. So um, yes, it, it used to be a death sentence, it seems like, but there has been so much progression that um, I don't think people are quite aware of that <coughs> it's very easily treatable if you get there right away. Because I have heard of people that they suffer a stroke and mm -hmm. they recover, they change their lifestyle perhaps mm -hmm. and, yep. and make adjustments and they go back to their friends and family and jobs. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So, But it all starts with making that 911 call, exactly. creating yes. the link yes. that we have here. Yeah. And I just want to emphasize too, that doesn't happen in all communities, does it, no, Aaron? No, no, we're, we're pretty lucky here in, in this city because you know, we have some, we have some record numbers with uh, our door to balloon times with heart attacks. We have record numbers with um, our stroke times. We have record numbers with our trauma times. Um, we we've got a uh, we're really lucky to have the medical director and uh, the other parts of the organization in place because it, we've kind of flipped it into a, a pretty progressive mm -hmm. system. And again, that wouldn't be in place if we didn't have the partnership with the hospitals either. So, oh, yeah. I mean, we're just, we're one piece of the puzzle. We're one link in the chain, like you mentioned. Uh, we've got to have everybody on, on board. And, and thankfully here in the, in the city of Lincoln, everybody is on board. And, and we see those uh, from year to year with the, with the statistics that we're able to obtain. So it's for your benefit, it's for our benefit in this community to have this link and to know that if you have someone in your life that is suffering a stroke, need some medical attention, call 911. You think you're doing them a favor by driving them there yourself or having someone else drive them there, but you have traffic. They have lights and sirens. They can get through traffic much faster than you can. And they are ready to go at a moment's notice. You have to find your keys, you have to get shoes on, you have to get ready to go, and you have to get the other person ready to go to get to the hospital. So 911 is the way to go. Amber, thank you very much for coming in. Aaron, always thank good you. to see you. Thank you. Catching good to see you up. too. And thanks everybody for watching us today on LNK TV, reminding you again that May is Stroke Awareness Month. Pulse Point is active in Lincoln and free in the App Store. Download it today. You could be the one.